Uh, friends, we continue with the study of methods of improving power system stability. In the previous lecture, we have studied some of the techniques which help in enhancing the stability of the system and the techniques which we have already discussed uh, last time are high speed fault clearing, uh, reduction of transmission line system re, uh, reactants. We also talked specifically about the series compensation, regulated shunt compensation, talked about dynamic braking, reactor switching, independent pole operation of circuit breakers and we came to single pole switching. Today we will discuss the remaining uh, techniques which aid in enhancing the stability of the power system. The techniques which we shall discuss will be single pole switching, steam turbine fast valving. Under this we will discuss the fast valving logic and typical valve closing and opening sequence. Then we will see the a typical result through simulation studies, the effect of fast valving on stability of fossil fuel fired station. Then we will talk technique like generator tripping, control system separation and load shedding, high speed excitation systems. Under this category we will investigate or we will see the <coughs> performance of two types of excitation systems, the AC exciter and bus fed thyristor exciter. Then at the end we will talk about the, the effect of high speed control of HVDC lines for enhancing stability and at the end small signal stability. As we have seen earlier, the single pole switching uses separate operating mechanism on each phase for single line to ground faults. Relaying is designed to trip only the faulted phase. Now, this is what is the important point that is when there is a line to ground fault, right, then the protection system will trip only the faulted phase. Then this will follow a reclosure within 0 0.5 to 0 0.1.5 seconds. And in case there is a multi phase fault, like say two phase to ground or line to line fault or three phase fault, then the all the three phases will be opened. This is very uh, powerful technique for enhancing stability and it is uh, used in EHV transmission systems. Uh, we take the advantage of this fact that most of the faults on transmission lines are line to ground faults and opening and reclosing only of the faulted phase results in improvement of tangent stability. As compared to three phase tripping and reclosing. Uh, some of the some of the uh, features which one has to study about the single pole switching are that single pole switching is attractive where, where you have a single line connects or wherever the single line connects the two, two systems. Because if there is only one line connecting the two systems, then, then the power which can be transferred with the stability comes out to be 0. Because the moment one line is faulted and you disconnect that line, then the power transfer becomes 0. right? Therefore, wherever there is a single line which connects the two systems, then if you can resort to the single phase, single pole switching, then some power is transferred on the healthy phases and the, and the, uh, the amount of power which can be transferred with the stability is improved. There is a tangent stability limit is increased. Another is that if you have a single line connecting a generating station to rest of the system. Suppose you have actually a generating station located at power off point and you have connected that station 
to the system through a single line. Normally, we connect through more than one line, but if the only one line connecting, then again there is an advantage in going for single pole switching. The problems associated with single pole switching are secondary arc extension. I will discuss the secondary arc extension, what it is, but it is a problem of secondary arc extension. The fatigue due to turbine generator shafts and turbine blades, if you are using because, because whenever you go for single pole switching, the operation of the system becomes unbalanced, right. Then the because of the unbalanced operation, the, the thermal duty on nearby generators due to negative sequence currents. Because when this one pole is taken out and only two lines are connected, then the stator windings of the synchronous generators carry negative sequence current and that causes additional heating in the machine. When we talked about the power system protection, we did discuss about the capability of generators that is the negative sequence current within withstand capacity of the synchronous generators. For few seconds, synchronous generators can withstand this situation, but not uh, on, on long time basis. Now, when I talk about the secondary arc extension, the problem is something like this that if you have a three phase system and you disconnect one phase at both the ends, right, and there was a fault on the phase which has been disconnected. Now, this, for this phase which has been separated or disconnected from the system remains electrostatically and electromagnetically coupled with other phases. And therefore, there is certain potential which is developed across the conductor which is isolated from the line. And therefore, that this because of this potential, the, the for at the fault point, right, the arc will be sustained this is called secondary arc. This, they say, you know what happened is that when the fault occurred, system was healthy before the occurrence of fault and this arc was, arc was <coughs> fed by the system energy. But the moment you have taken out the faulted phase, right, since this uh, is isolated, we, we feel actually that there should be no more arc, arc should be quenched. But because it remains uh, coupled to the remaining two phases, through electrostatic coupling and through electromagnetic coupling, there will be certain amount of voltage induced. And this is a problem which is a very serious problem. So far actually the, the single pole switching is concerned because you cannot reclose till that uh, secondary arc persists. Because if you reclose it again, you will find that it will be unsuccessful reclosure. The problem. Because whenever you adopt a technique, there will be some problems and one has to sort out those problems and uh, accept, uh, adapt the technique only when you are in a position to overcome those problems. Now, we take now another very powerful uh, technique for improving the stability of the system and that is steam turbine fast valving. Uh, historically, the fast valving technique was recognized long back somewhere in 1930s itself as a very powerful technique for enhancing stability, but because of certain uh, unresolved problems up to 1960 no attempt was made to apply the first valving technique for stability enhancement. Let us see the first, first valving is a technique applicable to thermal units to assist maintaining power system tangent stability. It involves rapid closing and opening of steam valves in a prescribed manner to reduce the generator accelerating power following, following the recognition of a severe transmission system fault. That is, if you find that there is a severe transmission system fault, so the electrical power, out, power output from the generating unit has reduced and mechanical input is same. Therefore, to decrease the accelerating power, right, one has to control the valves of the steam turbine, so as to reduce the mechanical power generated by the steam turbines. Let us discuss this. Uh, several utilities have tested and implemented fast valving on some of their units. For illustration of fast valving application, 
let us consider a fossil fuel generating unit with a tandem compound single reheat steam turbine. In fact, uh, steam turbines have different configurations. You may have a single reheat, double reheat, tandem compound, cross compound that so many different configurations are there. Further, the, this fast valving technique can be applied to nuclear power stations also. Right? But just for illustrating this technique, I have considered uh, this particular system, this fossil fuel generating unit that is a coal fired unit. Here we will have a single reheat turbine and it is a tandem compound. In tandem compound actually all the all the units are on the same shaft, high pressure, intermediate pressure, low pressure, all these um, stages of the turbine they are mounted on the same shaft. Now, let us consider this um, configuration. If you see this configuration then the steam enters from the boiler at this point. We have a main safety valve here, main inlet safety valve. There is a control valve, then the steam enters the high pressure turbine. After expanding in the high pressure turbine, the steam is sent to reheater, this is reheater. Then we have intercept valve. This is this valve is called intercept valve, and then we have again here uh, uh, this RSV, right? This is also a safety valve, right? A reheater safety valve we call it reheater safety valve. The steam goes the IP section. There are two sections shown here. After working in the IP, the steam will enter the LP stage of the steam turbine and you can easily see that high pressure, low pre intermediate pressure, uh, inter uh, this is low pressure, low pressure, all these stages are mounted on the same shaft and at the end is a generator connected. The steam which leaves the intermediate uh, low pressure section goes to condenser and then it is recirculated to the turbine. This is what is the uh, 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 configuration of the tandem compound single reheat steam turbine, the fossil foil unit, it is a coal fired unit. Now, here the, we have two possible controls, one is that you close this control valve. If you close this control valve, then the steam flow will stop and the mechanical power output will be reduced. Second is that yes, you control not the control valve, but you you close this intercept valve. This intercept valve when you close again the mechanical power output from the turbine will reduce. Uh, we will see the different configurations which can be used. That is the main inlet control valves and reheater interceptor valves. This I have told you that these two valves one is the main inlet control valve, another is the reheater intercept valve they provide a convenient means of controlling the steam turbine power. Because you want to control the steam turbine power for a short time momentarily, so that the, the system is uh, saved from losing synchronism. In fact, there are two uh, alternative schemes which have been discussed. One is the intercept valves are rapidly closed and then fully open after a short time. We do not actually uh, open the, the main control valve, only intercept valve is open and then closed again. I am sorry, that is the other way around. Intercept valve is closed and then open fully. Okay, the intercept valves. Now, since the intercept valves control nearly 70 percent of the total unit power, this method results in fairly significant reduction of steam turbine power. Another arrangement is that or you can say the more pronounced temporary reduction in turbine power can be achieved through action of both control and intercept valve. 
that is you control both the intercept wall as well as the control wall, you close both the walls. Now, this procedure of rapid closing and subsequent full opening in both the cases that is what you do is that intercept wall is closed and opened. Similarly, the control wall is closed and opened. Okay. This particular type of arrangement is called momentary fast valving. Then there is another uh, <coughs> scheme which is called sustained fast valving. In sustained fast valving what is done is that intercept valve is closed and reopened fully while the main control valve is closed and partially reopened. But what happens is that suppose the post fault system is weak. Right. So, once you partially reopen, it means you are reducing the mechanical power input to the system as a whole. Right. Therefore, that, that type of arrangement is called, called sustained fast valving. Valving is fast, it has to be fast because you know that if you want to save the system, then this mechanical power or the control should be fast so that they, they reduce the acceleration and deceleration. Okay. They, Generally, fast valving has been found to be effective and economical method of meeting the performance requirements of power systems where design and operating criteria require stability to be maintained for a three phase fault with delayed clearing because of stuck circuit breakers. Suppose you design your system so that system stability is maintained for this type of contingency where you consider a three phase fault with stuck circuit breaker. It means the, the fault is going to be cleared with certain delay. Under such contingency, the fast valving is very effective in enhancing the system stability because here the fault remains on the system for a longer time. The logic which is used for fast valving are One is for generating the wall control sequence and other is for generating unloading signal. Right? Now, let us look at the typical wall closing and opening sequence. Now, this diagram shows a typical wall closing and opening sequence. This is this diagram is uh, a simple diagram. Uh, in practice you will find that there will be always some deviations. That is this diagram shows the wall position as a function of time. Uh, now, suppose at time t equal to 0, you sense that yes wall is to be closed. Then you take uh, initiation or take, take initiate the closing of the wall. Then for a time equal to t1, t1 there is a certain time delay which is required to start the movement of the wall. That is you will find that t1 is the delay between the time of initiation and the time where the wall begins to close. These walls are generally very heavy and the lot of inertia is involved and the therefore, you will find that the moment you give start initiate the action there is certain time delay that is called t1. Then, from T1 to T2, the valve position is closed, so that actually slowly the valve is closed. At T2, you come, that is T2 is the valve closing time. You can say this time, that is from this point to this point, the time is valve closing time. T3, that is from this instant to this instant, this is the time T3, the time during which the valve remains closed and T4 is the wall opening time. That is you a time t equal to 0, you initiate the action for, for closing and opening the wall. Then this is the time delay, no opening closing takes place while in the same position. This is the time which requires for closing the wall. From this point to this point that is for time T3, wall remains closed. Then from this point onwards, it reopens and this is a fully open condition. This is partially open condition, this is fully closed position. That is when during this period when it is partially closed, 
right. Again you will find actually that during this period the steam is uh, flowing right because the parcel closure and certain mechanical power is developed. The mechanical power in the intermediate pressure and in the low pressure section is not developed during this period. Now, here the ability of steam valves to rapidly close and reopen depends upon the governor system which you used, because after all this is going to be actuated through the governor action and electro hydraulic go turbine governing or electro hydraulic turbine governor system is capable of this rapid control, because you have to close very fast. I will tell you typical timings for for uh, uh, closing and opening of this valve, but these times are very short. Now, I will just um, show you the effect of fast valving on the stability of fossil fuel fired station. Let us take a typical illustration to see the effectiveness of fast valving on improvement of stability. Now, here this really the, the example which I have considered here is that there is a plant which has two units of 500 megawatts and they are feeding power to the network and there is a close by a severe fault on the transmission network. Following that, following that the fast valving is resorted and in this diagram shows, shows the rotor angle in degrees that is delta, delta power angle delta versus time t in seconds. It is the swing curve of the machines. Without fast valving, this is the graph. You can see this is the graph. This graph is the graph or swing curve without fast valving and with fast valving this is the uh, swing curve, this is the swing curve with fast valving. You can easily see that without fast valving the maximum swing is something of the order of 120 degrees, while the maximum swing is now, now around uh, 70 degrees. And therefore, whenever we try to uh, investigate the effectiveness of certain devices for improving stability, then the swing curve conveys lot of information and what is the maximum swing that is important, right. Now, this graph shows, this graph shows the power in per unit on 100 MVA base versus time on this side. That is what has been done is to investigate or to show the effect of fast valving. Effect, effect of fast valving on stability of a fossil fuel station exhibiting a slow inter area swing. That is the graph which I have shown earlier. You can see actually that the, the, the swing curve shows that there exists an inter area swing, it is a very slow thing type of thing. But the point which I wanted to make here is. We show here this dotted graph, this dotted graph, you can see this, this one, I will just uh, highlight it here again. This graph shows the mechanical power with fast valving. That is at this point you have initiated the fast valving phenomena. For some time mechanical power does not change, then it decreases, it comes to from something like uh, 9.8 per unit, it comes down to something like 5.5 per unit, uh, 6.5 per unit, then slowly it increases. And you can see that this whole thing closure and opening has been completed practically in less than 1.5 second. You can see this thing that this graph. This, this is the uh, two second time, 
in 2 seconds you can easily say that practically it has reached the same level of mechanical output. Therefore, there is a dip in mechanical power which is generated and this dip has helped actually in uh, improving the dynamics of the system that we have already seen. Now, let us uh, look into certain special features of fast valving. The fast valving imposes a relatively severe transient on the turbine and steam generator system. What is happening is that you suddenly close, suddenly close the interceptor valve. Then what happens? The steam which is, which is coming from the high pressure side and it is actually trapped in the reheater, right? That steam is stopped suddenly because of sudden movement. There will be there will be a shock to the reheater and to the turbine side. Right? That is what is the point that fast valving imposes a relative severe transient on turbine and steam generator system. This is steam generator means boiler here, boiler reheater, and it also imposes on the turbine because in the turbine, which are carrying normal steam, you will find that actually suddenly mechanical input reduces. And because this sudden change in the mechanic, uh, steam flow affects actually the life of the turbine blades. And therefore, uh, I would ma mention uh, here that whenever fast valving is applied as a technique for enhancing stability, one has to evaluate, evaluate that what will be the consequences of this technique in terms of, in terms of the steam generating unit that is boiler reheater on turbine. That is when we talk about turbine, turbine blades, fatigue of the uh, shaft, all these things have to be taken care of and only when certain uh, situation demands that this is uh, effective and can be used is applied. Then there are some other techniques which can be used for enhancing stability. The generator tripping is another powerful technique uh, which can be used, but we have to be very careful in using this technique that is let us understand how this generator tripping helps. Suppose there is a large system right, and there is a severe fault on the system. Now, this machines in the system will be accelerating or decelerating depending upon what is the excess power. right? And all the techniques which we have discussing here mechanical uh, mechanical reduction in power that is you control the uh, steam valves or you apply actually the artificial load in the system right are basically to reduce the acceleration uh, under some situation you will find that you can trip certain amount of generation if you trip certain amount of generation again actually you will find the the excess power which was there to accelerate the system is reduced the, this is what is the approach here. A selective tripping of generating units for severe transmission system contingencies has been used as a method of improving stability for many years. But again, you know, the, the consequences of a tripping a unit have to be examined. Suppose you trip a unit because tripping a unit is easy. You open the circuit breaker, generator circuit breaker, you will find actually that the whole unit transform generator is disconnected from the system. Tipping is not, it does not take much time. Time taken is the same circuit breaker and relay operating time, right. But the moment actually the system generating unit which are supplying certain load, right, immediately you will find that there are certain uh, ill effects or tangents on that system. Speed will increase, governor will try to control the speed, right, and all these effects are there. One arrangement is that suppose you, you trip the machine and follow the normal procedure of shutting down. You close the steam turbine, you stop the machine. Another is that you use, let the machine continue to run for some time and supply certain auxiliary power or power which is required for meeting the auxiliary requirement. right? And then re-synchronize this machine when the system is becoming healthy. That is historically the practice of generator tripping as a stability aid was confined to hydro units and this practice has been extended to fossil fuel fired units and nuclear units in 1970 
because this is considered to be very powerful actually in a technique for saving the system when the system is subjected to very severe contingencies that is not in the position to save the system. Sometimes blackout takes place if you cannot take certain measures which have happened in our Indian power system also. Evidently tripping of a unit subject unit subjects it to sudden changes in mechanical and electrical loadings. You can easily understand this aspect. The unit which are supplying certain load, suddenly there is electrical power output is 0, mechanical output is uh, reduced, mechanical loading, right. With the associated impact on generator, prime mover and energy supply system. Again, again as I have discussed actually about uh, the fast valving phenomena. Similarly, when you talk generator tripping, right, they, it affects the steam generating system, it affects the turbine, it affects the generator, all these units. And one has to examine very carefully the impact of tripping before you resort to this type of practice. In fact, the thermal units are not designed for frequent full load rejects. Generally, whenever, do, when, whenever the machine is unloaded, the load is slowly reduced. Full load rejection means machine is running at 100, 100 percent loading condition and you trip the machine. That type of situation is very uh, dangerous to the thermal units. <coughs> now, the, this is a warning that generator tripping technique for improving system stability should not be used indiscriminately. They understood actually. The following are the major turbine generator concerns. The over speed resulting from tipping of the generator, thermal stresses caused by the rapid load changes and the short fatigue life consideration. All these are the major considerations they have to be evaluated, examined before you make use of this, uh, this approach. But this is considered to be one of the very powerful uh, approach for, for um, enhancing system stability under certain, um, certain I would say severe contingencies. Another approach is control system separation and load shedding. Uh, control system separation may be used to prevent a major disturbance in one part of the interconnected system from propagating into the rest of the system and causing severe system breakup. Now, this uh, in, it is something like this, this normally we call this eye landing, eye landing therefore, you have a large interconnected system and if a disturbance has occurred in a part of the system, you do resort to eye landing. So, that the, the disturbance does not propagate to the remaining part of the system. And Today, certain steps are being initiated in our Indian power system also, so that we can save part of the system whenever some disturbance occurs in a certain part of the system. Because in 2002, January, the, the northern regional grid completely collapsed and no part of the system could be saved. From that point onwards, efforts are being made to, to resort to certain techniques, so that at least you can save a certain part of the system and complete blackout is avoided. Uh, uh, <coughs> globally also certain approaches are being adopted to save the system from complete blackout. Uh, today the terminology which is used is called wide area protection system, uh, which requires actually the synchronized phase measurement units to be used, so that you have a common uh, time for the complete system. The all system operates in a completely synchronized manner the timings are all synchronized and if they have a synchronized arrangement, you can have the synchronized phasor measurements and monitor from central point. So, that you can find out where the disturbance is coming and what to do to save the system from blackout. The impending system instability is detected by monitoring one or more of the following quantities in the sense that how do we monitor that yes a disturbance is coming in a particular system and it is going to propagate into the remaining part of the system. One is sudden changes in power flow through specific transmission circuits. 
well one indication on a particular line some power is flowing and suddenly you find that there is a wide change in the power flow that is one indicator. Change in bus voltage angles, rate of power change, these are some of the indicators that can be used to initiate the system separation. A very uh, complex problem in fact, it is not then easy to talk about the separation. Now, upon detection of impending instability, impending instability, control system separation is initiated by opening appropriate tie lines before cascading outages can occur. Few, few selected tie lines have to be opened. In some instances, it may be necessary to shed selected load in the separated system. That is when you separate the system, problem may come, there may be generation load unbalance. Wherever you have a more generation and load less, you have to shed some generation. Wherever you find that load is more than generation, you have to shed some load, right. Therefore, this is another, uh, this is to be approached, there is no way out. You will find that whenever you do this uh, islanding, you will not be in a position to make the island to have a load generation balance impossible. Wide area protection and synchronized phasor measurement units are applied for this type of uh, uh, protection purpose or for this type of uh, uh, islanding. Okay. <coughs> now, next is the high speed excitation systems. How high speed excitation systems helps in improving the tangent stability of the system? Over the years, there has been development in the in the excitation system technology. I have discussed the different excitation systems in my previous lectures, and we discussed the excitation system models also. Now here, uh, significant improvement tangent stability can be achieved through rapid temporary increase of generator excitation. Idea is something like this actually we make use of high initial response, high ceiling voltage excitation system. Now, un normal, normal uh, fault conditions, what happens the terminal voltage drops. You will find actually that whenever the system fault is there, the voltage at the terminals of the generator will be low. The automatic voltage regulators will quickly uh, take action and apply to the field winding. Uh, maximum voltage, which is equivalent to the ceiling voltage, which will cause in turn increase in field current and internal voltage. Now, this internal voltage which is which is increased by this action will help actually in increasing the synchronizing power when the fault is cleared. This is the mechanism here. There is increase of generator field voltage during a transient disturbance has the effect of increasing the internal voltage of the machine and this in turn increases the synchronizing power. Because we have discussed in the beginning itself that we have to take measures so as to increase the synchronizing power which can restore back the system to the new operating condition. This is one of the approaches. The AVR responds to this condition by increasing the generator field voltage and this has beneficial effect on tangent. The effectiveness of this type of control depends on the ability of the excitation system to quickly increase the field voltage to its highest possible value. That is, if suppose the excitation system is slow, you will find it will not be effective. It has to be fast. That is why the effectiveness of this technique depends on the ability of the excitation system to quickly increase the field voltage to its highest possible value that is to the field we apply the highest possible value that is the ceiling voltage. Here the high initial response excitation system with high ceiling voltage are most effective in this regard. The ceiling voltage again then what should be the ceiling voltage is what is the maximum voltage which can be applied to the field winding of the synchronous generator that is called the ceiling voltage. All the excitation systems are designed to have certain ceiling voltage. The ceiling voltage are however limited by generator rotor insulation consideration. For thermal units, the ceiling voltages are limited to about 2.5 to 3 times the rated load field voltage. Suppose a generating unit has a rated 
field voltage of the 250 volts, right? Then the ceiling voltage may be 750 volts, the three times. Right? This is what is the meaning, and this uh, voltage can be raised from 250 is the nominal value to 750 in a very short time. The first excitation response to terminal voltage variations required for improvement of tangent stability often leads to degrading the damping of the power system oscillation. This is another ill effect of, of high response uh, or initial response high ceiling voltage excitation system that causes the degrading of the damping that sometimes it adds negative damping and therefore, we need actually the application of PSAs to overcome this problem power system stabilizers. A lot of research work has been done on this and we have discussed actually the effect of PSS in the previous lectures and the effect of high, high, um, uh, high initial response excitation systems on the stability in previous lectures also. The, high, the use of high initial response excitation system supplemented with PSS is by far the most effective and economical method of enhancing the systems. In fact, actually out of all the techniques which we have discussed so far, this is a very accepted and tool for, for enhancing the system stability. You will find today large capacity machines will have high initial response excitation system, high ceiling voltage and along with power system stabilizers, the ill effect of high initial response excitation system which enhances tangent stability, but degrades the damping is overcome by providing PSS. Let us just look at the comparison of tangent stability with a AC exciter and a bus fed thyristor exciter system. In fact, here I will make the comparison between the two excitation systems. One is the AC exciter system where you have a AC generator rotated, uh, rotating or stationary rectifier system. Right? Another is that you, you have a static excitation system which is take, which takes input from the bus other than taking from the terminal of the synchronous generator the bus in fed that is the bus fed thyristor excitation system. Thyristor word of course is used thyristors are required in both the cases, but here the meaning is one is a static excitation system another is a rotating excitation system. <coughs> For the purpose of uh, illustrating this thing we have considered a system with two generating plants or two 500 megawatt plant, there are two units of 500 megawatt uh, capacity. A three phase fault of 60 millisecond duration on major transmission line is considered. The, for example, I considered certain uh, improvement by using the fast valving, same system is here also. You have a power plant with uh, two 500 megawatt units and there is a major fault actually in the uh, transmission system and three phase fault is considered. The fault duration considered is a 60 millisecond. If we use for this particular system, the critical clearing time with AC exciter, it is 47.5 millisecond only. For this particular system with a particular type of fault considered with AC excitation system, AC exciter the critical clearing time is 47.5 millisecond while the critical clearing time with static excitation system is 62.5 millisecond. Obviously, the fault duration is 60 millisecond. With this AC exciter, the system will become unstable. With thyristor excitation system, system will remain stable. This is illustrated through uh, swing curve again here. Uh, rotor angle here. You can see that this firm line shows the, the swing curve with thyristor excitation system with PSS and this is AC exciter. You can easily see that the system with AC excitation system has become unstable while the, while the static excitation system remains stable. The beauty right because normally the stability margin is always just by knowing actually the critical clearing time and the actual fault clearing time. For example, in this case the with AC exciter there is no margin system is unstable, 
However, with the static excitation system, they, we have a margin of 2.5 milliseconds. Now, we discuss uh, some more uh, techniques. One is the control of HVDC lines. Now, in some systems, we have HVDC lines and wherever HVDC lines are available, they, we can uh, take the advantage of the HVDC lines because HVDC line is one where you can quickly, quickly uh, change the power flow on the line. The controls are such that you can increase the power flow uh, at a very fast rate. You can say that ramp up the power output or uh, ramp up the power flow on the line or ramp down the power flow on the line. This control is very fast. This is only clearly by adjusting the firing angle of the thyristor valves, you can appropriately ramp up or ramp down the power flow on the line. And this advantage can be taken wherever you have HVDC link. Uh, when, when I am talking about here, I that this is an AC system with additional HVDC link already operating. Uh, it is not actually that we have two systems connected by HVDC link. It is not that way. They are not two asynchronous systems, same synchronous system, but there is a HVDC link. Now, an HVDC transmission link is highly controllable. It is possible to take advantage of this unique characteristic of HVDC link to augment the tangent stability of the AC system. During a tangent disturbance, the DC power can be ramped down rapidly to reduce generation load unbalance of the system on both sides. On some situations, it may be necessary to ramp up the DC power to assist system stability by taking advantage of short term overload capability of the HVDC system. Normally, the HVDC systems have short term overload capacity and all these control measures are only for a short duration. Now, just before I close my discussion on the methods of tangent stability enhancement, let us discuss about small signal stability enhancement. The problem of small signal stability is one of the insufficient damping of power system oscillations. The use of PSS to control generator excitation systems is the most cost effective method of enhancing small signal stability of the power systems. The application of power system stabilizers and their capability in enhancing stability I have discussed in my earlier lectures. I am not uh, going to repeat the discussion on PSS, but today, today all excitation systems which are manufactured by, by excitation system manufacturers, they provide power system stabilizers as integral part of the excitation system. Now, the utility companies have to tune the parameters of their excitation systems or power system stabilizer, so that the local as well as interior modes of oscillations are damped out. Now, my before I close the discussion on the methods of improving the stability of the system, let me mention that <coughs> the new technology that is the flexible AC transmission system technology is evolved primarily to have flexible controls on the system. For example, if you whatsoever we have talked till now. Uh, <coughs> Is, is either on the generator or on the turbine or on the HVDC line, but very little discussion I have made on transmission line. Now, here when I talked about the application of series capacitors or for compensating the transmission line reactance or TCSC for, for, con, for control, comp control compensation of the transmission lines. In fact, actually the application of these fax devices whether it is uh, TCSC or uh, SVC or Statecom or UPFC or other fax devices, all these fax devices have the capability of controlling power flow on the transmission line and we can regulate the power flow on the transmission line uh, rapidly. And on these systems also we can add certain devices to damp out the oscillations. That is, I can use TCSC 
for improving tangent stability as well as dynamic stability. I can control actually the line impedance for enhancing both the stabilities. Similarly, you can control uh, the state com or sun connected devices or UPFC, where you can enhance both, both tangent as well as the uh, dynamic stability of the system or improve the damping of the system. Today, the lot of research work is being carried out to coordinate the tuning of the fixed devices as well as the, the power system stabilizers. So, that we want to coordinate the tuning, so that the, the devices are tuned in a coordinated fashion. Now, with this, uh, I have completed the discussion of techniques of improving the uh, power system stability. A variety of techniques have been used for improving the tangent stability of the system and dynamic stability of the system. And these techniques need to be judiciously used, taking care of the system considerations. And on, only one technique is not sufficient, <coughs> one has to choose a, a, a group of techniques or a combination of certain techniques have to be used to improve the system stability. With this, I have completed the series of 40 lectures on, on power system dynamics or say power system stability. During this, we have discussed the modeling of the system, synchronous generator modeling, excitation system modeling, turbine modeling, governor modeling. There are various techniques of uh, analyzing the stability. Then we have discussed the voltage stability, we have discussed about the power system stabilizers and at the end, the techniques for improving the tangent stability of the system.